We have a few announcements this morning. Um, one that I will start with is just a reminder that we still have our Lenten uh, soup supper on Wednesdays. This week and next, we will be meeting in pastor's office or in the church office. So please uh, attend if you can. We will be doing chapters um, 10, 11, and 12 this week. So we hope to see you there for um, great discussions, great food, and fellowship. Any other announcements we have? Don't sing the bottom song. <laughs> That's actually our budget for the year. That will come up in my uh, little dissertation I'm going to give all of you uh, to give you a lot of information. As a congregation, periodically, you need to be brought up to speed with what's going on in the church, both because it is not only your right, but sometimes you need to know what we're doing, and it's your obligation as members of the church to really be aware of what, what's going on. So first I'm going to discuss a little something about Pastor Peter. Uh, as most of you are well aware, Pastor Peter had open heart surgery back in January. That's a life-changing event. Added to that that his wife is near the retirement age and they are considering their options. Peter and Janelle's uh, son lives in Chicago as does Peter's brother and Janelle's family, if you remember from various discussion, lives out on the west coast. So they're deciding how they're going to proceed with their life in the next few months. That being said, Pastor Peter will not be coming back. Now, three Thursdays ago, the Executive Council of Church, or Executive Committee of Church, was invited by Pastor Nielsen to come to a meeting where we were introduced to the Reverend Jamie Possinger, who is considering uh, becoming a minister here. And there's some things that I want to bring out so that you understand, because periodically many people have asked me why we can't have a full-time minister or a regular part-time minister. So I want to give you a little hindsight to, to bring you up to speed on how these things work. And I'm going to talk to you about Pastor Possinger's particular uh, uh, situation in that she is a minister with well beyond 21 years of experience. The Synod has guidelines for remuneration for its clergy. And ministers in that area who work full time are supposed to receive anywhere from seventy-eight to ninety-eight thousand dollars, plus twelve percent of that amount as a pension. So now we're talking anywhere from another nine to twelve thousand dollars. And then on top of that they're paid insurance. We've always offered here the gold plan. We've done gold plan for a husband and wife is somewhere in excess of $20,000. Plus, of course, then they get mileage reimbursement for mileage they use on the job. So the first time that we hit this number up here as our budget is that a full-time minister with that type of experience is way more than our budget allows. They would eat up our entire budget. So what do we do with then, let's say, a half-time minister? Somebody who we would share with another church. A half-time minister would then get half of that. Now we're talking somewhere in the area of half of that budget number. That is still unrealistic with the expenses that we have for the rest of the expenses of the church, the upkeep, the salaries that we currently pay, and then the bad things that happen. Because our budget is extremely tight. So what kind of bad things happen? Well, a lot of you don't always realize when those things happen, but the urinal in the men's room need to be re needed to be fixed. And in doing that, we found that the water system downstairs, the water tank, also needed to be replaced. It's original when this building was built. Those two items alone cost us over $2,500. This is unbudgeted money that just sort of comes up. Now, I'm not trying to be a... Uh, a bad guy and tell you that things are dark and dreary and we're in terrible shape. We're not. Over the last several years, we've been able to accumulate a reasonable amount of money that we have in a money market. We are in good shape. In fact, and I don't want to say this because I don't want you to do this, but if nobody donated after today, we can get by the rest of the year. Barely. 
there are in this congregation, and I just did all the numbers, those of you who got statements back in January or beginning of February, there are 37 donors who are members of this church. Those 37 donors don't donate that money. Those 37 donors donate about $107,000 or approximately $2,850 per donor. So a donor would be either an individual person or a husband and wife. The rest of that money comes from occasional members. This church actually only has right now about 75 members. And by the way, those 37 donors only represent 54 people. The rest of the people who claim to be membership of this church either don't come anymore or only come very, very occasionally. So the rest of that money then comes from outside donors. We have several very generous people who used to go to this church who still remember faith on a regular basis. And then we collect rent money, we have faith fair, other things that bring in the difference. So that brings us back to Pastor Possinger. We have negotiated with Pastor Possinger to come on and to work as a part-time minister. Our advantage is that she retired at the beginning of February, so she doesn't need a pension. She does not need medical benefits. So she only gets a salary and car remuneration. And that falls well within what we have budgeted in our budget to pay that minister. We are in good shape that way. Until, of course, something else bad happens or, God forbid, things start costing more, because you know that never happens. <laughs> and of course, there are those people who are greedy, like Molly and Janet and, and John, who expect that periodically we thank them for their services and give them a raise. But nah, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Molly Berry, I, I, I'm going to tell you a, a secret about Molly. When we hired Molly, I was, I was involved in that, and Molly said, I said, Molly, what do you want to make for faith? What do you think it's worth to be an organist? And she gave me a number, and I said, Molly, <laughs> we don't even pay close to that to our current organist. I said, I'll see what I can do. And so I got Molly a little bit more than what we were paying our previous organist. Now, at the time that Molly asked that, we also had interviewed several or other organists, and they were asking somewhere in excess of, they started at 20000 and worked their way up. Some of them actually wanted to dictate the liturgy, meaning they didn't let the minister dictate the liturgy, they would dictate the liturgy, something that we don't normally do. So Molly is pretty close, pretty close, but not at what she actually asked for six years ago. So God bless you and thank you, Molly. So the last thing I'd like to talk to you guys about is this. How many of you were here last week? I think almost all of you were. You remember, Pastor, the pastor was here, Pastor Peter, was talking about the Ten Commandments and how Pastor Peter said, you don't look at them as thou shalt, but more like, if you love me, you will not kill. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And Jesus probably did the same thing for us. If you love me, you will love God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. If you love me, you will love your neighbor as yourself. If you love me, you will follow me. At a church, as members, we have benefits. You may not always realize what they are, but in a lot of churches you cannot have a say unless you're a member. We're, we're like that. You need to be a member to be able to vote, to have a say on our budget, to have a say at council, to, to have your complaints listened to. I mean, you can complain if you're not a member, but we may or may not listen to them. But if you're a member, we'll listen to you a little bit better. <coughs> but one of the things about being a member of a church is you also have some obligation. The obligation is to help to support that church. And that generally means helping out in any number of ways. Could be mowing lawn, could be... Uh, you know, fixing things in the church periodically. It could be helping out by taking care of the columbarium, things like that. But it usually involves financial help. At Faith, we have never, never told you what you had to give. We never will tell you what you have to give. 
because that is between you and God. You need to decide how you've been blessed and then how you pass that along. And when we talk about the church, it's just not the keeping this facility open, paying the electric and gas, those things of course have to be done in insurances, but it's also our outreach to the community and to the wider world. It is our ability to give benevolence to the synod that goes to national, that helps support missionaries, that helps give scholarships to people going to synod. All of those other kind of things come through your donations. As a little aside, when we were talking to Pastor Possinger, I would like to tell you that she mentioned a church, a Lutheran church, in Allentown, where you can go and have worship. But if you want to be a member, if you want to be a member, then you need to bring in your W-2s and sit down, and you need to sign a pledge of 10%, a tithing. Wow is, yeah. yeah. We are mostly retired people. That would be a huge wow. I just want you to think about that. I also would like to have you uh, think about a couple of other things. First of all, let me add one more thing about passing passenger. She will be here, God willing. We are the, this, this far from being perfectly done with our negotiations. She will be here effective April 1st, subject to the approval of the bishop. She will preach three out of every four Sundays, unless it's a five Sunday month, and then she'll preach four out of five Sundays. So you will have the opportunity to have communion much more often. You will have a minister that's going to be here more often. She is going to work two days, as opposed to the one that Pastor Peter was working, which means she will have more opportunities to get to know you as a congregation, to visit our members who need in-house visit or hospital visits. I have talked to Pastor Moore and his wife about Pastor Possinger because they happen to know her. And she is a dynamic and very good preacher, according to Pastor Moore and his wife. She is very enthusiastic and an energetic person. She is in our general age range as she is recently retired. So I'd like you to keep her in your prayers. I'd like you to keep the church in your prayers. And when you're at home today, I want you to think about that number just a little bit. And I'd like you to take your statement, if you still have it, look at it. If you don't, figure out what you donate a year. Multiply that times, I'm going to round 37 up to 40. Multiply that times 40. Now, we all can't give the same and we all don't give the same. But assume we did for your purposes. Just take that figure that you donate a year, multiply it by 40, and see where we'd all be. See how generous your offerings are and what you can do for faith and what faith can do for this community and for the world. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right, if you will, please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the God who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts with that hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know, forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace out of love for the world. God draws us near, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn today is Just As I Am, Without One Plea.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. first reading this morning from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look upon the serpent of bronze and live. Word of God, word of life. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 107. We'll read it responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious acts. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food, and drew near to death's door. Then they were troubled, they cried out to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word, and healed them, and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love, and for your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Our second reading this morning from the book of Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of the flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were, by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. gospel this morning is from John chapter 3. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Good. This morning I want to um, focus on for the kids who are not here, so you guys, Grandma and Grandpa, are going to get some stuff, on uh, what Mr. Gillis wrote, Mike Gillis, read about, and that is grace. We don't often think about that, you know, Lent is a time of reflection and repentance and just kind of moving our hearts towards the glory of Easter, right? But it's so hopeful that we have within the readings for each Sunday pieces that give us something to hold on to. <laughs> so I want to get with okay. the people. <laughs> something to hold on to. It's my teaching self. You know, I'm all over the place. I apologize. And that's something today is grace. You know, God gave us that grace. Well, what is it? It's, um... When we just think angry thoughts, that driver on the highway, or somebody just um, cuts in front of us at, at a ticket line, or in the grocery store when somebody takes the last thing that you wanted, it gets upsetting. And we just think nasty thoughts. None of us are really cruel people on purpose, but even the thoughts we have, and God reminds us, that the commandments have carried us to love God and keep his commandments. Is that possible for us? I don't think so. It's not possible. I sometimes just get so frustrated with myself when I do naughty things. And that's what I was going to talk about with the kids. Those naughty things 
are covered by God's grace. So what is that grace? It is love, the love of God. It's approval, approval of you and me. I never thought of that. Just being okay with God because he's given us his grace. And favor, you are favored among people because you believe in Jesus Christ. That's a gift. We need to remember that. So what I've done is I put together grace for coloring. Anybody who wants to take one home for grandkids is welcome, or kids. And to remember that there is joy in that grace. And what does joy mean? Well, today is I choose joy. What does joy mean? It means if I can it means to put Jesus first, J, others second, and you last. Because that will be emanating God's love. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to remember that you grace us. Put that umbrella over us and give us such a peace of love, approval, and favor to be with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Peggy. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my soul be appropriate and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're getting closer and closer to Holy Week. Closer to Holy Thursday. Closer to Good Friday. And closer to the cross. You can feel it in the lessons we're reading. There's more than just a Lenten feeling to those lessons. There's a sense of darkness, a sense of warning, and a sense of discomfort. But there's also a sense of overwhelming hope in the midst of that darkness. Closer to the cross. How close to the cross do we want to be? The earliest followers of, of Jesus sure didn't want to be very close, with the exception of a few common women, one of whom was his mother, and the one disciple, probably John, the followers of Jesus scattered and were nowhere to be seen. So how close do any of us want to be? We're actually kind of lucky. We know what's coming, coming but the disciples did not. And we have a few weeks to still decide. But the disciples only had a few hours. As Christians, we can be a real funny group of folks. We're all about being saved, singing hymns, and talking about being saved. We love beautiful worship services that just thrill our hearts with beautiful music and inspiring images. Trumpet fanfares on Christmas Eve, Easter morning, and the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. The glowing candles, they can be so inspiring. Is it any wonder that the attendance in church increases during those two days, Christmas and Easter? But then we come to Lent, and Lent leads to the Passion, to Holy Week, to Monday, Thursday, to Good Friday. When was the last time that we saw a church packed on Good Friday? Attendance at worship seems to plummet during this time. Why? Could it be that we're afraid of the cross? Could it be that we don't want to be too close to the reality? The cross is dark. And like most children, we're afraid of darkness, but that's okay. It's okay to be afraid of the cross. It's, afraid, it's okay to be afraid of darkness, as long as we don't ignore the cross and the darkness. Thinking about today's Old Message Testament and the Gospel lessons, it isn't often that we get direct reference to a lesson in the Gospel. But today we do, and it's an incredible reference. You absolutely cannot miss the connection. 
Think about the story in Numbers. The people are out there in the wilderness. They're basically like children walking around in the darkness. They're afraid. And the story tells us that they're impatient. But the reality is, is that they are afraid and afraid of the unknown. So they begin to speak out against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? You brought us out into the wilderness to die. There's no bread, there's no water. Our souls loathe this light bread. But God has delivered them out of slavery. God has saved them from a sure death at the hands of the Egyptian army. And God has provided food and water for them. It may not be exactly what they wanted, a great feast with wine and all kinds of great food, but it certainly was better than the bitter water of slavery. So what does God do? God sends poisonous serpents to bite the people. And that's when the people realize that they've pushed God too far. How many times have we done that? Do we realize that we may have pushed things too far? So they begin to apologize and ask for forgiveness. And like any good father, what does God do? He forgives. But look how he does it. He has Moses raise the, the bronze um, scepter up on a pole. And he has a serpent on it. And when everyone is bitten, they look at this serpent and they are healed. Now consider the way today's gospel lesson begins. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is not one of those subtle metaphors that needs to be puzzled over. This is a metaphor that jumps out and grabs us directly. And yet there's still something puzzling that needs to be done here. Why is John comparing Jesus to a serpent? Doesn't that seem strange? And so with today's lesson, in the Gospel of John, it reveals that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than a light, for their works were evil. But he who does the truth comes to light, that his works may be revealed, that they have been done through God. The light that has come into the world is Jesus. He is the light that guides us out of our wilderness of darkness. The light that is our salvation. But how is that salvation achieved? Once more I'll ask, how close to the cross do we want to be? Early believers didn't want to be close at all. It was a horrifying spectacle. The teacher they loved was hanging there, bloody, dying in agony. And anything beyond what we could even imagine was just uncomprehensible. Death on a cross was possibly the most degrading, horrifying, and ugly, excruciatingly painful way to be executed. It defied all logic to believe that the Son of God could possibly die on the cross. In fact, St. Paul is clear with regard to the meaning of the death on the cross. In Galatians 3.13, he writes, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, if we take that small section of verse out of context, we might completely miss the real point of this gospel. But as many have done in the past, we see those words are only part of the entire verse. The whole verse reads as follows. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And that's the point. That's exactly the connection that we can make back to the Old Testament. Why is John comparing Jesus to the serpent in the Old Testament lesson? Because just as those serpents were sent as a curse to the people, there in the wilderness, in the darkness, so Christ became our curse, which became our benefit. Just as that curse in the Old Testament, the serpent, was lifted up on the pole, so too was Jesus, our curse, lifted up on the cross. 
Just as the people in the Old Testament lesson had to look upon their curse, lift it up on the pole in order to be healed, so we too need to look upon our curse on the cross in order for us to be healed and receive salvation. So again, how close to the cross do we want to get? We want to experience all the uplifting wonder and beauty and the joy of Christmas and Easter. We want to be thrilled with the music. It just makes us feel good to sing joy to the world. And Jesus Christ has risen today. But I think we need to take a lesson from our brothers and sisters who have also sang those incredible moving hymns, Were You There? And Calvary, Every Time I Think About Jesus. You see, we can't get from Christmas to Easter without going through Holy Week. And that means that we have to go through the cross. We have to fully understand what John is saying to us in chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. For God so loved you that he gave his Son, and that you who believe may not die, but have eternal life. This is why we get close to the cross. We have, to stand, we have to understand that what's up there on the cross is our curse. It is our sin. It is our evil and darkness. And Jesus takes that on to himself and dies up there for us. And when we are baptized, when we are marked with the sign of the cross, we too die to that sin. We get close to that cross the moment we are baptized. We are marked with it for all of eternity. We have eternal life, but we cannot get there without the cross. All that wonder and beauty and joy of Christmas and Easter, it's all meaningless unless we go through the cross. That's what we need to reflect on this Lenten season. Just as the people in their wilderness of darkness looked on to that serpent and were healed, we need to look on to the cross so that we too can be healed and receive salvation. Let us pray. May the God of love who passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who is the light in our wilderness of darkness. Amen. 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 You may rise as you are able. We have our hymn of the day, God of grace and God of glory.
Join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Gracious God, your love unites. Give vision to the global church and foster cooperation in mission. Increase interreligious understanding and ecumenical dialogue. Make your church a sanctuary for all fleeing persecution, disaster, and war. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, your love enlivens. Restore balance to the earth's fragile habitats. Preserve wilderness lands, rainforests, and wildlife. Cleanse oceans and rivers. Make us good stewards of the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give thanks to those who courageously witness to your liberating love. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all whose loved ones perished from pandemic disease in every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who live with chronic illness and pain. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We pray especially for Dan, Tom, Valerie, Uriel, Pastor Michael Ryan, Artie and Dick, Ron, Phyllis and Jim, Josephine, Bob, Deb, Shirley, Tom, Jack, Pastor Peter Kurtz, and the congregation at St. John and Scott Run, and those we name aloud are in our hearts at this time. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. Incarnate God, your love enlightens. <laughs> Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Hear us, O oh God, your, your mercy, mercy is great. Abiding God, your love saves. Those who died in the faith are made alive in Christ. We give thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to the newness of life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on your journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. Peace, Molly. Peace. Peace, Hola.
Jesus, you are the bread of life. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us with hunger for justice and peace. We pray for this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, you are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Our sending hymn is What Wondrous Love Is This? Number 385. <laughs> Thank mm-hmm. you.